that work so we can just send you away and you go? Would that work? It's uh, 520 now. If we could, I'd like to bring this uh, meeting to order. I'm warning about the foundation. Uh, this is the April 12th, uh, 2012 meeting of the Jefferson City Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, my name is Chris Jordan. I am the vice chairman uh, and will be chairing the meeting tonight. Um, I think first of all, we will have the members introduce themselves, starting with our council liaison. Good evening. My name is Sean Schulte, uh, city council liaison. Mike Lester. Bunny Tricky Cotton. Bob George. Dave Nunn. Ian Swatman. Dale Vaughn. Dean Dutoy. Scott Stacy. Eric Barron. Janice McMillan. Drew Hilpert. Thank you, everybody. Uh, city code authorizes nine regular mender, members and three alternates. Alternates are designated to vote upon absence or disqualification of any regular member. A quorum of five members or alternates is necessary to conduct business. Um, and do we have a quorum tonight? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, the following regular members uh, are absent. You wanna read that off for me? Uh, are there any members who will be disqualifying from voting on any agenda item? Seeing none, um, I will at this time disclose, um, I'm assuming we have someone here to speak on this request, but for case number P12005, a uh, rezoning plan on Hoover Road, um, the membership of double vision enterprises uh, does include a member of my family uh, jim jordan who is my uncle i do not have any financial interest in this property and i will not be um, disqualifying myself voting members are as follows jack deacon dean dutoy bob george michael lester david nunn scott stacy Chris Charnell is not here tonight. Right. Okay. Uh, Bonnie Tricky Cotton, Dale Vaughn, and myself upon a tie or something to that effect. Uh, now we'll call to see who is present for the following cases. Uh, case number P12004. Uh, that is a rezoning on South 10 Mile Drive. I believe we do have Mr. Gratz here to speak on that tonight. Okay. Uh, who do we have present for case P12005, the 300 block of Hoover Road, Central Missouri Professional Services? Thank you. Um, do we have any requests for continuance on either of the cases? Seeing none. Um, the format of the hearing, I will let Eric uh, introduce the format of the hearing and the order of testimony. Thank you. I would like to briefly describe the procedures of the Planning Commission. The proceedings of the meeting are being recorded, so I ask that when you speak, please step to the microphone and give your name and address for the record. After a brief introduction by city, class, er, city staff, the applicant and applicant's consultants and advisors will explain the project. The opening presentation shall be limited to 10 minutes. And sh applicant shall be given three additional minutes for closing testimony if so requested. We will then ask to hear from supporters of the request. We will then ask to hear from any opponents of the request. We will then ask to hear from anyone else who wishes to speak on the request. And the testimony from supporters, opponents, or other interested parties shall be limited to three minutes. And rebuttal testimony shall be limited to five minutes unless additional time is granted by the commission. City staff will then describe the proposal and make the recommendations on the request. In order to reduce the time necessary to hear an application, reference to printed material, including the staff reports, applicable findings, ordinances, and our statutes shall not be read into the record unless directed by the commission. And the staff reports and recommendations, if any, on the matter before the commission shall be presented to the commission before the commission acts on the matter. The commission will then close testimony from the floor. And prior to motion or discussion on the case, the commission will discuss the proposal and publicly make its determination with reasons. The form of the motion shall be positive. That is, the motion shall be made to accept the request as presented or with modifications, stipulations, or conditions. And the final vote will then be taken, ayes in favor, nays opposed. And the chairman shall announce the results of the vote, specifying the number of votes cast in favor and the number of votes cast against. 
and the following documents are entered as exhibits for all items under consideration at this meeting the city code as amended the comprehensive plan and land use map copies of applications under consideration a list of property owners to whom notices were sent the affidavit of publication of the public notice in the newspaper copies of drawings plans and our renderings under consideration letters or memoranda from staff the staff reports minutes of proceedings letters photos memoranda or other materials submitted by the public or the applicant and the rules of procedure for the Jefferson City Missouri Planning and Zoning Commission and these items are public record and are available for inspection in the Department of Planning and Protective Services or through the office of the city clerk thank you Eric uh, Next, we'll have the adoption of the agenda. Um, can I have a motion to adopt, adopt tonight's agenda as printed? So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Uh, next, we'll need approval of the minutes from last month. I'm assuming that everyone's had a chance to kind of read through those I move we approve the minutes as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Staff has indicated that we have no correspondence this evening on either of the case. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. We will move along to the first case tonight. Case number P12004. 2827 South 10 Mile Drive, a rezoning from RS1 to C-1. Eric, if you would, uh, give us a staff report and information on this. Thank you. Uh, first, to orient you to the location of this property, uh, up on the screen is a map of the area, uh, including zoning map. Um, you'll see at the, toward the top of the screen is the intersection of Missouri Boulevard and Stone Ridge Parkway. Just off the screen to the right is the Coles um, department store. And uh, South 10 Mile Drive is this road right here. And the property is, uh, is a house, um, essentially the third, third building on the left down South 10 Mile Drive. Uh, is currently zoned RS1, single family residential, and currently in use as a single family residential house. And the property is owned by the same individual that owns the uh, C1 zoned property that, that I'm pointing at here. Uh, which is in use as a real estate office and that is the applicant for tonight's case uh, William and Nancy Gratz are the property owners uh, the purpose of the request is to uh, rezone the property for for uh, potential future commercial redevelopment uh, the property would be paired up with the real estate property uh, in order to provide a single uh, developable track uh, this area is located within the South 10 Mile Drive, Kimborg Hills neighborhood. Uh, there is a neighborhood plan that was adopted as a component of the comprehensive plan um, back in 2010. And uh, that plan essentially uh, called for that or supported commercial rezonings in this area if certain criteria were met. Uh, within the staff report are the, the four separate criteria. Um, there are also responses. Uh, to the criteria that were provided by the applicant and are briefly um, uh, addressed within the staff report. Uh, the four criteria are essentially that the property is adjacent to an existing uh, commercial use, that the proposed rezoning consists of a minimum of a half acre, that the rezoning is to C1 zone, and that a reasonable plan to develop the property as a commercial use has been developed. Uh, essentially all those criteria are met although the last one in lieu of a actual uh, plan being developed um, it's it's recognized that there's sufficient area to address the um, items that would need to be addressed within a plan uh, specifically uh, items such as buffer yards parking driveway access etc uh, up on the screen is an aerial photo 2011 air photo of the property uh, the house is highlighted. The uh, real estate office that is next door that is uh, essentially paired up with this application uh, does have an existing uh, parking lot and existing drive access. And then I do have one photo of the property, which is kind of dark, uh, but as I said, it is in use as a residential house. Uh, 
uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any initial questions, but I think that's all I have for now. Thank you, Eric. Do any of the commissioners have a question for uh, staff at this point? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Gratz, if you'd like to come up uh, this evening and uh, give your presentation. For the record, Bill Gratz, the 2315 Route M, Jefferson City, Missouri. Uh, we're just here to request a continuation of zoning to the neighboring property to make our property larger, uh, more usable for future C1 use. It meets all the criteria of the neighborhood development plan. Uh, at present, we have a young couple that's renting it. The house, it'll be used as a single family rental house until such time the entire property is developed C1. Have any questions, I'll answer them. No questions from the commission? Thank you, Mr. Gratz. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this request? Seeing none. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this request? Seeing none. Um, seeing that, we will close testimony. And Eric, I will let you give your staff report. Uh, thank you. Again, the, the four criteria are all met. The property is adjacent to an existing commercial use. Uh, the property, when combined with that ad uh, adjacent uh, property, uh, consists of uh, 1.3 acres, which exceeds the half acre minimum. Uh, the rezoning is uh, proposed to a C1 district, and there is sufficient space to meet the uh, requirements of the zoning uh, code on the property. Um, the, st the staff recommendation is for approval of the rezoning request. The recommended form of motion is for approval of the request to rezone the property from RS1 to C1 be happy to answer any questions how does it affect the tenants if it's rezoned to C1 they're still allowed to live there because it's grandfathered in or yes they are allowed to live there the house would be would be grandfathered in um, if for any reason the the house were to burn then there are certain protections that would allow it to be rebuilt uh, within the commercial um, zoning uh, as a non-conforming uh, use if for any reason the house was demolished voluntarily it, it could not be rebuilt um, as it's uh, would be sitting on commercially zoned property if those tenants move out can new tenants move in yes certainly any other questions for uh, staff this evening regarding this case okay seeing none uh, would someone like to make a motion on this request Move to approve the request to rezone the property from RS1 to C1. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion regarding this case? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Gratz, I will uh, let you know that this uh, body does forward all of its recommendations to the city council, and uh, obviously city staff will be letting you know about the dates for that. Okay, thank you. All right, the next case is P12005, the 300 block of Hoover Road, a rezoning from RA-2 to PUD and a preliminary PUD plan. Uh, Eric, will you give us a report on that? Certainly, thank you. Uh, first, to orient you to the, the location of the request, uh, up on the screen is a map of the area with the zoning shown. Uh, you'll notice Highway 179 going through the middle of the map and uh, Truman Boulevard and, and Industrial Drive, the intersection of, of Industrial and, and Highway 179 or, or Truman Boulevard, it's, I think it's actually got four different names if you continue south, is uh, located there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you'll notice West Main Street is, is kind of toward the bottom of the screen as well. And, uh, and Hoover Road, which comes off of West Main Street and ends in a cul-de-sac uh, right at the southern portion of the subject property. Uh, the property is part of the uh, former Cherry Creek condominium development. Uh, that particular development um, uh, consisted of a, a large number of uh, multi-unit apartment buildings. Uh, is a development plan that has been abandoned and the property has essentially been, been split into two separate ownerships 
with the uh, northern portion of the the ownership of the the property owners are, are essentially continuing with a, a development plan for apartments and then the southern portion of the you know, again the old cherry creek condominium development is the the subject property uh, consists of about 8.5 acres and is solely accessed off of hoover road that is the only access to the property at the Hoover Road Gulf site. Now the proposal is uh, comes in two parts. It's a rezoning proposal and a preliminary PUD plan. Uh, rezoning from RA2 to PUD in order to support the, 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 the PUD plan. Um, I have uh, an aerial photo uh, of, the, of the property. You see it's, it's mostly undeveloped. There is an existing building uh, located on the uh, southwest corner of the property. Uh, was intended to be a maintenance building for the uh, for the development. Uh, it is a part of the the PUD plan, and uh, also have a picture of the PUD plan. Uh, that that is the complete document. I, I have a blow up. Uh, a little bit easier to see. Uh, the uh, north is is to the left, so. Um, but uh, you'll uh, in the in the lower right hand corner of the plan is the uh, the maintenance building the existing uh, maintenance building. Uh, let me address a few components of this PUD plan. It is um, probably best thought of as an apartment complex, even though it's mostly duplexes and, and tr well, it is duplexes and triplexes that are shown on the plan. Um, it is all private driveways, so these are not intended to be public streets and and would not be maintained uh, by the city. So each of these uh, streets, so to speak, on, on this plan are all private driveways. And uh, again, there's uh, uh, duplexes and triplexes uh, shown coming off of those driveways. Uh, the, the plan essentially shows uh, 10 duplexes and 11 triplexes on the property. Uh, there's an existing, uh, again, the, the existing maintenance building is intended to be a future community building. And then one residential unit, um, if you look uh, where, where my pointer is right there, uh, one unit is uh, intended to serve as a, as a future uh, maintenance or office uh, building to, to serve the development. Um, the development is, is uh, pretty much targeted toward uh, uh, retirees or, or senior living. Uh, it would include a, a number of amenities, including gated access, curbside trash collection, street lights, landscaping, and interior and exterior maintenance. Again, it's essentially an apartment complex, except with uh, individual units being rented rather than, than units in a multi in, in an apartment style setting. Uh, the maximum density that's outlined in the plan is 62 units. There are not 62 units shown on the plan. Um, uh, within the text of the plan is is the ability to uh, substitute uh, triplexes for a pair of duplexes. Um, the the thought being that um, uh, depending on how the the development progresses and and how their um, uh, customers what their customers demand essentially, uh, they may uh, substitute out a triplex for for two duplexes or vice versa. Uh, so they they'd like to retain a little bit of flexibility in that regard. Uh, but with a maximum of 62 units over the 8.5 acre site. Uh, it's uh, proposing an underlying zoning district of RA2. Um, the building exteriors within the development plan are identified as brick on the front and brick and concrete board siding on the sides and the rear. Uh, there is a landscaping component of the plan with uh, a minimum of one tree planted adjacent to each building. You'll see a number of trees shown on the plan. Um, in consultation with the developers, it, it, it was mentioned that more than likely they would provide more landscaping than that, uh, but this would be the minimum as proposed by the plan. Um, there is a sidewalk network shown on the plan. And uh, as far as parking goes, each residential unit uh, would have an attached one car drive uh, uh, one car garage plus a driveway, so essentially room for two cars. Uh, plus, there are parking spaces shown uh, uh, at the ends of some of the streets, along some of the driveways, parallel parking along some of the driveways, and then a, a larger parking lot next to the, the community building. 
I do have a couple pictures of the property. Uh, again, it's an undeveloped uh, site. This is a picture uh, sitting from the, uh, the Hoover Road cul-de-sac looking uh, north. And a picture of the existing uh, community building. And I believe that's all I have for now. I'd be happy to answer any initial questions. Do any of the commissioners have uh, questions for staff at this point? Seeing none, we will ask the applicant to come up and fill us in if there's anything else to be filled in. Please state your name and address for the re report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chamber. My name is Paul Sampson. I'm a Central Missouri Professional Services, 2500 East McCarty Street. Eric has done a very, very good job of uh, filling you in on the majority of the details about the development. Um, again, the, uh, the area has been abandoned for several years, and uh, the Jordan uh, group has, has purchased the property w just within the last few months, so they're excited to get going and uh, um, eliminating an eyesore in the community. Um, the previous development plan originally called for 148 units within this 8.5 acres. They were all going to be in uh, four-story apartment buildings and two-story townhomes. Again, we're down to a maximum of 62 units with this development plan. Um, the reduction in units allows for increased green space, uh, reduced traffic on Hoover Road and on West Main Street, uh, reduced stormwater runoff, and, and numerous other benefits to the community. Um, a little bit more about uh, the units themselves. Uh, each unit's going to be approximately 1,100 square feet, uh, two bedroom, two bath units. Uh, each will have its own single car garage. Um, exterior patios. Um, some of the units, uh, most likely along the east side of the property, which will be on the upper side of the, the sheet that's being shown, um, those will potentially have walkout uh, basement availability. Um, exteriors will all be uh, maintenance free, uh, brick and concrete siding. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the units will be available for lease, so the entire property will be owned, maintained by a single ownership group. Uh, that ownership group will take care of all the maintenance. They'll be providing uh, curbside trash pickup uh, for being deposited at a single location on the site where the trash company will then come and, and uh, pick it up. That will um, reduce the trash vehicles through the, through the neighborhood and, and save on wear and tear on their streets. Um, all the uh, infrastructure in the development is uh, readily available. Uh, the main uh, infrastructure extension that will have to be done is a sanitary sewer along the east side of the property. Um, it will be extended along the entire length of the property to the south end. Um, and the, uh, the benefit of that is that uh, there's an existing pump station that's on the property just to the south. Um, the extension of that uh, public sanitary sewer main will allow the uh, adjacent property owner to eliminate that uh, private pump station and as well as extending pri uh, public sewer to the maintenance building which is a, uh, a separate standalone lot um, so that'll uh, fix a problem that's been there for uh, for some time um, storm sewer systems in the development uh, the east side east side of development will all be collected in uh, private storm sewer systems and it'll be discharged at the uh, East property line. Again, uh, that was the, the plan with the original development. Um, advantage here is that we've got a uh, reduced number of units, reduced storm water going to the adjacent properties. Um, the development on the, the west side of the development will go into the public storm sewer system that runs uh, north and south of uh, Hoover Road, and then that uh, ultimately goes to the detention basin that's located at the far northwest corner of the original Cherry Creek development. Um, that's really the, the nuts and bolts of it. Again, the uh, owners are happy to, to be doing this project and uh, eliminating an eyesore in the community. Uh, Mr. Jim Jordan is here if uh, you've got any specific questions for him, and I'll be happy to answer any questions as well. Many of the commissioners. Uh, have a question for either one of the gentlemen here this evening this will be Jeff City's first gated community right I think 
think so, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the As far as the, uh, the, the gated community goes, there's, I'm assuming there's procedures in place for access for uh, taxis that people may call or ambulance access to the... To yeah, the, the, the owners are kind of in the middle of investigating the, uh, the best method of, uh, of accommodating that. I mean, it's not the first gated community that's been done anywhere, so it's just a matter of doing some research and finding systems that are, you know, I, I assume that most of this comes out of the box type systems that uh, will accommodate fire, police deliveries and, and those type of things yeah. and uh, the the streets are gated but there's no fencing or correct correct it, it's okay. just a, a vehicular gates okay and then the one last question is um, uh, the amount of sidewalks uh, it seems like you you stop just short <laughs> of having the you know like a, a good pedestrian plan here um, uh, you know, especially along that east that east row, um, is that something you would consider? As to well, the 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 main reason the sidewalk are situated the way that they are is that you know the the goal was to have sidewalks on one side of the street everywhere, which um, there's probably 99 percent of that that accomplishes that. There there may be a couple of instances where looks like over by the maintenance building maybe we don't have sidewalk along that part of the street um, the reason the the sidewalks are located where they are is that we're also providing some on-street parking I think we've got around 30 plus spaces of parking on street and that will provide space for any visitors of the of the residents to have places to park for you know other than the the, the garage space and the driveway space that will be available for each unit that way you've got parking for visitors and, and things like that. So the, the uh, sidewalks have been placed adjacent to those on-street parking spaces. Yeah, it, it seems to meet the, requ the requirement for the underlying zoning, you know, as far as like the number of sidewalks. Uh, um, you know, for what it's worth, it would just be my suggestion for the quality of life of the people that would be living there. I presume you're looking for older, mm -hmm. older clientele on that that, you know, would you know of an evening would want to walk or or something that they have uh, that they have a, a better pedestrian system there but that's just a suggestion right and, and like I said the the plan is um, if you want to call it minimalistic in the fact that it to show that it meets the requirements but the the owners have uh, uh, verbalized to me that you know it, it's real easy to add stuff in after the fact do more than what's required and you know, with the with the type of, of development they're wanting to put in, they want it to be nice for the residents. They, you know, you know, maintenance, you know, maintenance free brick, uh, concrete siding, exteriors, extensive landscaping, um, you know, things like that. They they want it to be a nice development. And, um, I, I wouldn't guarantee that the sidewalks that are shown on the plan are the only sidewalks that would be built. And Paul, there is a sidewalk <coughs> connection, correct, to the uh right on the on the. Uh, my mouse the sidewalks there. connect to existing system both on the uh, south side to the Hoover Road cul-de-sac and the uh, the system does extend through the development up to the northwest corner which uh, basically would temporarily dead end at the adjacent property which with plans that as that next property is developed that sidewalk system would get extended to go to the uh, end of the uh, Cherry Creek Court cul-de-sac off of 179 okay thank you any other questions for the applicants this evening seeing none thank you thank you is there anyone present who would like to speak in favor of this request seeing none is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this request seeing none um, we will now close testimony on this case and we will let staff uh, give us their staff report. Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I believe that there's a, an engineering item of concern, uh, plus uh, Shane has a staff report to go over as well, correct? Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, 
I'll go over my staff report. Uh, Paul did a pretty good job of covering over the, the infrastructure and improvements that are proposed with the, the development uh, in regard to stormwater, as, as he had indicated, the, um, the impact would be less than what was previously uh, proposed and approved on the, the uh, apartment and condominium plan. Um, the majority of the west portion of the property would uh, be tied into the uh, main storm sewer that uh, traverses the property from the north and the south from Hoover Road. Uh, and then the remainder would then drain to the east uh, to the cemetery property, all being considered as far as uh, with uh, the original development as far as the detention uh, basin that was built on a regional basis to the north uh, for the, uh, that the city may, uh, has obtained. As far as sanitary sewer, it's uh, again proposed to serve the, the, the property and be extended from the north uh, from the uh, from the north and then all the way to the portion of the south property sidewalk as we had just indicated um, would be extended to the north for possible future extension to sit Cherry Creek Court and then also ties to Hoover Road uh, street access and traffic impact uh, a previous impact study had been provided and again as Paul had indicated that would be less th uh, with this proposal than what uh, what, had, what was approved and proposed originally. Uh, as far as utilities and street lights, fire hydrants, uh, additional um, lighting and hydrants are being proposed in accordance with our standards as far as the city uh, standards go. Uh, back on the stormwater, uh, we would request that um, we're working with the property owner to the north. Um, in the previous development, uh, we did find that uh, some of the infrastructure was not accepted yet uh, uh, by the city, and so uh, we would like to work with the owner to investigate the, um, the uh, main storm sewer to make sure that there's no other items that need to be done and go ahead and try to get that system accepted as a city system. Uh, we want to make sure that it's clean of any debris uh, since the uh, development did uh, was kind of left uh, unfinished uh, to ensure that uh, what we have there is, is something that meets our city standards. Uh, that would be the only uh, comment that I would have as far as us being an item of subject to pr uh, recommendation of our approval. Shane, regarding that uh, issue of the uh, maintenance on the uh, existing systems, is that something that you guys will coordinate with with both owners and uh, the city will send out staff to check that to make sure it meets our requirements what we've done on the north property is actually tried to go down in and try to TV that um, what we would suspect would be possibly some uh, some forms that may be left over um, minor offsets in the pipe if necessary we we really couldn't tell on the north property when we went down in to uh, be able to determine we couldn't get it through it completely there was quite a bit of debris in the pipe on down on the downstream side of this pipe so uh, what we would look to try to do is get into the pipe take a look at it see what's what we could do and then if we could work to try to get the owner to if we could get that cleaned up so that uh, it would be an acceptable form then we could go ahead and take that over as, as being accepted into the Mr. city Chairman. system I have a question on that uh, <coughs> that's so-called catch basin or whatever the right okay does the stormwater explain to me is the stormwater does that collect the stormwater you're talking about the city's property to the north that's over by 179 is that what yeah. you're referring to the yeah. one that, the one that yeah right uh, that was that was originally laid out with the subdivision and it at not only serves this development, but it serves the entire watershed that's down to that point, all the way up to West Main Street and uh, Truman Boulevard, in that area. Uh, so um, it would serve this area, and m the city actually ended up with that piece of property in negotiations with the original development of this, this subdivision. What, well, okay, the other question I have is uh, since since Jim's going to be pouring a lot of concrete and up what have you up here, there's going to be a lot more surface water heading that direction. It seems to me, uh, is that going to be a mosquito problem? Uh, 
I guess that's the purpose, what it was built for, to collect that foam water, right? That's correct. Um, in the in the construction of, of the development, um, there were things that were put in place down at the, the basin to uh, capture any kind of erosion and sediment control down on that portion of it. Uh, those were meant to be temporary. They're still in place. Um, there would be additional in, uh, items that would be added to the final plan on this portion of the development that would try to keep a lot of that out of the system to begin with and make sure it doesn't get into there. And so uh, we'd be looking at that closer with a final final layout of this plan and also uh, if anything needs to be done with the basin down there that would be something that we'd have to and that would be basically that would be the city's obligation to to remedy this problem rather than the builder right not necessarily I mean I guess if uh, if it's if it's the basin the ba the basin's been accepted by the city that part is the, the city's property down there so uh, we would hope to get all the uh, uh, measures in place on this so that that we wouldn't have to have the pipe clean back out again or that there wouldn't be any of the sediment or erosion that would be getting into the system. What I do in terms of the final plan is look at uh, erosion, sediment control, silt fence, rock checks, things of that sort to make sure those are put in place with this plan so that that all doesn't end up either over on the cemetery property or down into the pipe again so or in the detention basin. So Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Shane at this point? Eric, I'm assuming you have something you'd like to report for us. Uh, just very briefly, staff does recommend approval of the rezoning and preliminary PUD plan request. Uh, the form of the motion comes in two parts. Uh, one, motion for approval of the request to rezone the property from RA2 to PUD. And two, motion for approval of the preliminary PUD plan subject to compliance with the recommendations of the engineering division. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm assuming before we move forward with any kind of motion or discussion between the Commission members I guess I'll ask the applicants tonight if they've been made aware obviously tonight or any time in the past about the uh, issues that the uh, engineering department has brought up and are you willing to accept those conditions please step up we have been aware of been made aware of the issues with the stormwater and will uh, definitely be uh, willing to discuss those with the city. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Staff members have any, uh, commission members, excuse me, have any thing they would like to discuss before we move forward? Seeing none, I'll be interested in uh, a motion tonight. And uh, Eric, I believe you would like to have two motions. Are you wanting to do them as one or separately? Uh, separately. Okay. Thank you. Move to approve the request to rezone the property from RA2 to PUD. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Motion carries. We need another motion for the preliminary PUD plan. If Move to approve the preliminary PUD plan subject to compliance with the recommendations of the engineering division. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Both motions carry. Uh, once again, with this case, I would like uh, to let the applicants know that we recommend our approvals to the city council and I'm sure staff will get with you on those uh, dates and times. Okay. Um, with that, I will go to Eric for miscellaneous reports. No miscellaneous reports. But we do have other business. other business then I um, believe that you all have a, a handout passed out to you uh, before the meeting uh, regarding the uh, zoning uh, zoning code amendments that, that we're putting forward for for discussion at this point uh, there were seven of them that were discussed at the last meeting uh, we're actually uh, putting forward uh, only five of them uh, tonight uh, with a a recommendation to um, uh, allow us to to go ahead and notice them up for um, for 
uh, official adoption by the Planning Zoning Commission at the next meeting uh, as with any amendments to the zoning code standard uh, public notification procedures are uh, followed uh, essentially uh, publi pub publicizing the uh, the notices in the newspaper and on our website etc the five items that I was going to address uh, tonight are the fences garage size outdoor lighting uh, the authorized land uses and zoning districts and the parking standards uh, number three and number six the buffer yard and telecommunication towers are, are being held off uh, hopefully until next month uh, there's uh, quite a bit of paper there in the handout so uh, quite a bit of reading material uh, each of the five items I've included the the cover sheet that was uh, presented to you last month it kind of gives a, an overview of the issue examples from other cities and our recommendation on the matter um, after the the cover sheet is um, the actual legal language uh, that, that we are developing it's still a draft at this point um, but uh, is the the language that we'd actually propose for uh, the, the zoning code amendment so for the first item fences uh, again our recommendation uh, on the matter was uh, essentially to establish design standards for fences uh, that has been a problem in our community in the past that we have no design standards for fences uh, what we're recommending is uh, requirements that fin fences be constructed in a workmanship like manner that no more than two different types of fencing materials be be permitted uh, that no fence uh, be made of cloth canvas sheet metal or other like material and uh, that the finish I'm sorry the finished side of the fence face outward so that any posts on on uh, 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 fences be be facing in toward the the, the property uh, also an allowance for uh, residential double frontage lots uh, to have uh, fences in their backyard um, up against the, the the road that that is their backyard a double frontage lot is is a lot where uh, uh, roads front on the property on two si um, on, on opposite sides with the house facing one direction and the person's backyard facing another road um, currently they're only allowed a four foot tall fence whereas other people are allowed a, a six foot tall fence in their backyard um, on the back of that page is the, the again the actual uh, legal language uh, that we'd be proposing for the zoning code amendment are there any questions on fences I have a quick question Eric um, and I know we've talked about this before in other meetings and other matters but not I guess trying to help city staff is there ever been a definition of workmanship like manner I think that can get you know depending on the abilities of the craftsman who's putting up the fence they may say it's really good when you may look at it and say it's really bad or vice versa so has there ever been or do you know of any kind of definitions or standards or is it going to be that three people from the construction industry go out together and the two of them have to agree that it's workmanship quality and <laughs> something like that and we have a vote do you do either of one of you know of something like that I just I agree with the standard I appreciate your thoughts there but I'm trying to make sure that we don't put ourselves into a box and have problems yeah uh, that, that language was actually taken from uh, from a, uh, an example you know from another code from from another city uh, I agree that that it is is somewhat loose it does give a little bit of um, yeah how do I put it a uh, strength for for code enforcers and, and building regulations officials to um, you know at least apply a little bit of professionalism toward putting up a fence I think uh, that, that it may be hard to define workmanship but it's pretty easy to spot non workmanship manner uh, in other words fences that that are, are thrown up that that are obviously not not uh, constructed to any type of so you think at this point you guys feel comfortable with the language and uh, the language still is a draft and uh, I'm still working with the legal department on on that uh, certainly if that if, if that is an item of legal concern we can uh, get it addressed well maybe in Drew's new capacity he can come up with something really great for us <laughs> thank you Eric um, uh, Eric don't we already have some similar language to that in the code on I think it's on signage isn't there isn't there some already some language in there about 
I, I would have to look it up. Um, uh, not, not off the top of my head that um that I know of, but it oh, could yeah. be there. Yeah, I thought we had or. Okay. Uh, well, I think it was in the in the site barriers for for dumpsters. We included uh, some statement in there about it had to be in, in good repair or something along. Yeah, Those lines I think some, so. Some language that it, we might already have. The, the proposal for double frontage lots with uh, streets in the rear of the property, this will change it to allow privacy fences up to six feet tall? Yes, as long as they're set back 10 feet from the property line, uh, putting a six foot tall fence right up on the property line in, in a lot of cases would just uh, stand out. Sure. So okay. that, that's what the proposal is. Yeah. Eric, I know that I personally don't know any properties in town where houses say you have double frontage, two roads paralleling. I don't particularly know any houses that flip-flop where one neighbor faces this road, the other neighbor faces the other road. So then if you had someone with wanting to put a fence in their rear yard, which obviously the house next door, that would be adjacent to their front yard. How, if that would happen, do you know how that would be addressed? Does this address that? Uh, I, I think it does. Um, there, there are some examples of that um, that that I could I could certainly point to. Uh, most of them are in Old Town, where uh, there used to be a house there, and it's been demolished and the lot acquired by the the person who who backed up against it, so that they have a, a larger backyard, and so their backyard is is squeezed in between two houses on the you know on the opposite street. Uh, if you look in the in the language. Uh, the the stipulation is that the the fence be either set back 10 feet from the from the right away line or with the established build line of the street whichever is greater uh, the the purpose there being is if there is a, a row of houses on the street that the fence would have to at a minimum you know Stop not be location. closer to the street than that that build line okay for staff at this point regarding the fences thank you Eric Okay, the second item was detached garages. Uh, again, the, the issue there was that uh, many people are wanting to construct garages larger than uh, what is permitted by the current code. Uh, the current code uh, essentially maxes out garage size at 1,000 square feet. Uh, the recommendation is for large properties um, consisting of, of about a half acre or an acre, uh, depending, to, to have a, a, a larger garage. Um, the discussion last month was for houses of a half of an acre be allowed 1,250 square feet and houses, I'm sorry, houses with lots of one acre to have 1,500 square feet. Um, again, the first page is, is the handout from last month. If you look on the back of it is the, the legal language. Uh, changed it around a little bit to, to let it match up with um, kind of the format of our existing code, which is based on square footages. Uh, and uh, struck out uh, uh, the basically the current language and, and in its place established a, a chart uh, showing uh, lot size and what the maximum garage size would be for you know depending on your lot size. So it's very easy for a person to to look at the chart and determine the maximum size of garage that they can have. Uh, rather than using the half acre and acre numbers, we switched over to square footage numbers. Would those be total square footage rather than, so if someone, say, had a two-car attached garage and decided they wanted to add another garage at a later point, they, they couldn't exceed those maximums. Is that correct? No, it's not so total. <laughs> no. In that case, uh, believe it or not, doesn't come up too awful much. Uh, occasionally, there's there's someone that wants to, wants to build a second garage usually it's right next to their first garage uh, sometimes it's it's a second garage because the first garage is an older one that you know barely you know qualifies as a modern garage to begin with um, now there is a language uh, within here and and it's all on this sheet um, Or 
or maybe it's not. Uh, there is language in the code that does not allow the uh, total square footage of all accessory structures to be larger than the than the house than the primary that's kind of structure. Okay. And and so, and uh, that's that's in the current code. So uh, even if they did have multiple structures, be it a pool house, a garage, and a storage building or something. Uh, once they're all totaled up, they, they cannot be larger than the house. Are there any questions regarding garages? The next item is outdoor lighting. Uh, the the issue here there, there's actually basically two issues. One is uh, there's certain cases where uh, outdoor lighting seems seem uh, a higher level of outdoor lighting than what's permitted in the current code seems to be appropriate, uh, specifically for vehicle sales lots and underneath uh, canopies, be it uh, gas station canopies or or bank drive-through canopies, etc. Uh, the proposal, oh, I'm sorry. That, that's the first issue. The second issue is that uh, large parking lots uh, uh, tend to put off a lot of glare, and we've got a, a number of complaints from, from uh, citizens uh, in that regard. Uh, large parking lots putting off glare uh, through all uh, the, the wee hours of the night, and doing a little bit of research on that subject found that uh, there are several cities who uh, uh, basically require large parking lots to to shut off half of their lights or reduce the intensity by half uh, during the the late nighttime hours. Uh, so the the proposal is to address both of those items at the same time uh, to uh, allow um, up to ten foot candles underneath uh, canopies and for and for vehicle sales lots. Uh, the the current maximum is, uh, for example, for the C two district is four foot candles. Uh, a, a good example of 10-foot candles is underneath the, the high V uh, gas station canopy. Uh, they, they happen to have 10 underneath that canopy. And then also at the same time, uh, uh, establish a requirement for uh, parking lots that have uh, four light poles or more to uh, uh, be installed so that they can shut off half of their lights uh, or reduce them in intensity by half after 11 p.m. And uh, that can be kind of a complicated topic, but uh, certainly dealing with foot candles and lighting levels, um, I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions if, if you have any on that matter. Just, just real quickly, in an instance like you're talking, you mentioned where you've had complaints about existing, I assume for existing uh, facilities, it would be the same thing as, as with the uh, grandfather clause in, in buildings that they wouldn't be required to meet the current standards unless or there'll be some wording they'll address. They'd have to be either replaced or if they were replaced, they'd have to meet the current standards or something to that effect. Yeah, as as the zoning code works, they would be grandfathered in. Um, I think that, that some of them already do, you know, or have their lights set up in, you know, with that ability to shut half of them off. Some of the, some of the really large developments, um, you know, certainly probably not all of them. Um, but uh, uh, we we often get into discussions with uh, some some of the larger developments uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to to address complaints, you know, on on their lights being too bright or or on all, all hours of the night. And this would give us a little bit more uh, guidance in terms of what the best practice is, even though they're grandfathered in. And, and just out of curiosity, would would it go with the the requirement that the new uh, re regulations be met come into play after a certain amount. Let's say they had five light poles, but only one had to be replaced. Would they be able to replace that one pole the way it had been, or would they have to meet the new standards with the, or is it just for the entire property? I don't no, know it's sense. it's kind of a gray area there. Uh, certainly, if 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 there is one pole that that got you know needed to be replaced for maintenance purposes, more than likely that would just fall under a maintenance category. If it was a case where the entire parking lot was, you know, a new lighting plan was being established and it was all being removed, 
um, then that would, you know, and, and replace, and certainly that would fall under the new code. If it's some sort of mix of the two, um, uh, well, it would kind of depend on the specific circumstance. Jess, you have something? Yeah, I'll, I can provide a little guidance on that. Um, back when the city first started um, considering parking lot landscaping, there was a provision added in the code at that time for non-conforming parking or for parking lots that didn't conform with the landscaping standard. A similar provision could be added in for parking lots that don't comply with these lighting standards. You could have a standard for how they could come into compliance. So that could that could be added. And a lot of, um, I think a lot of commercial businesses are interested in reducing their lighting because of energy costs and being more responsible um, in that area. So I think we may see some more effort toward um, installing lighting that's more energy efficient and turning down the level of lighting when the business is closed and that kind of thing. But that is an option to add a section to address those situations that we were discussing. On the reverse side, Janice, if um, say uh, we, sh you all showed here that <coughs> uh, Riley Chevrolet had asked for a variance, I guess, to up their wattage, you know, obviously they're building the new Toyota facility on past that. Yes, it's a commercial area, you know, it's up there kind of by itself and, you know, I don't know if it's, their request was due to, you know, issues they were having at night, but would, would this allow someone to come to the city and maybe say, can we get a temporary uh, variance or a variance uh, until it's developed in case there were, you know, if they're, if they're at the end of, I guess what I'm saying is somebody's at the end of the street and they're just saying we need more light to protect our property and, and the things that are there. Could, could they still get a variance out of this? Or are we saying no, this is the standards live by it? I mean, has that avenue been looked at? Well, they, you know, a party can always apply for a variance. Um, in some cases, there are specific standards for the Board of Adjustment to guide them in making that decision in the form of findings. And in others, there are not. But um, there's always the right of a property owner to appeal a decision of any staff decision and to, to requ request a variance. Any other questions regarding lighting? Yes. Um, in, the, in the case of a, of a, of a non-conforming uh, establishment um, that's been grandfathered, uh, what mechanism would we have to know that they're replacing lighting? Uh, in city code enforcement, you know, people have to get building permits if they're going to be doing a certain amount of work. But some what would stop somebody from replacing every pole on their property they wouldn't need a building permit to do that uh, typically they would need an electrical permit yes they would okay yes. all right thank you any other questions of staff regarding lighting the next item is uh, authorized land uses uh, there's basically five different items uh, that we're uh, proposing to change in the uh, in the zoning code matrix, and uh, on the on the back of the pages is, is the actual legal language that that we're proposing. Uh, but the the proposal is uh, probably best addressed on the front of the page uh, to uh, take vocational tech schools and business schools um, and and differentiate between sites on five acres or less and five acres or more. Um, you know, the, the typical uh, Columbia College or, uh, uh, you know, is a, is, a, is a site that is typically less than, than about five acres and uh, uh, permitting them outright within the C1 and C2 districts. Right now they're uh, classified as a special exception in those districts. And then also permitting them in the, in the C3, or no, apologize. Uh, Uh, essentially uh, allowing them as special exceptions in the uh, C3 and M1 districts and permitting them in the in the C2 and C1. And 
and then uh, print and copy shops, uh, which are, are right now are not allowed in the C1 district, uh, even though they, they tend to uh, be a, a retail sales and service type of, of business, uh, so allowing that. Uh, contractor and trade shops, uh, listing them as a conditional use in the C2 district. Um, when when they have outdoor storage, uh, there's uh, that that is an item that tends to come up. Uh, feel that uh, uh, contractor and trade shops uh, are are allowed in the C2 district if they have no outdoor storage right now. Uh, but if they have outdoor storage, then they're they're essentially pushed to the to the manufacturing districts with the amount of uh, C2 zoned property in our community. Uh, feel that it, it uh, deserves a little bit of flexibility there to to allow them to locate in the C2 district as long as there's you know, appropriate review by the, the Board of Adjustment through the conditional use permit process. And then uh, motor vehicle washes uh, currently are, you know, car washes are currently a conditional use in the C2 district, uh, even even though there's there's several of them in, in our community all in the C2 district, uh, feel that, that they should just be permitted outright. And then dog grooming, which is an item that, that tends to come up a lot uh, it's it's an item that's not specifically listed in our land use matrix, and uh, we're proposing to list it, define it, and permit it in the C1 and C2 districts. And again, the, the actual language is on the back page, and I got to apologize. The the different zoning districts are not listed uh, within the 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 exhibit that's shown in that ordinance. Uh, again, it's just a draft. Um, but at the uh, toward the bottom of the page and then on to the next page is uh, the proposed definition for a dog groomer, uh, which is was taken uh, from a combination of other uh, codes. Are there any questions regarding the, the changes to the land use matrix? Okay. On the parking? Uh, the final item? Um, actually, oh, sorry. I did. Um, the, on the print copy shop, how would you distinguish a print copy shop from like a, a industrial printer? It it is actually defined. Um, there there is a separate category in the in the zoning matrix for the the industrial type of of print okay. uh, printing biz or okay. facility. Okay. Dog grooming definition on, on the discussion on the front. Um, just talks about dog grooming. But the language in the back talks about boarding dogs. So that's kind of a that's quite a different um, practice. Okay, with with no overnight boarding. Did I miss something here? Canine daycare for all or part of a day. And did I miss ah. Ah, I see. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Certainly wanted to distinguish between the, the borders. And boarding is, a, again, a separate item uh, okay. within the matrix. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions regarding land uses? Okay. Okay. The, the final item is, is parking, and basically five different items. Uh, with regard to parking, three of them fall into kind of the same category, restaurants, fast food restaurants, uh, and uh, bars or taverns. Uh, right now, they're, they're all, uh, the parking requirement for those three uses is, is based on seating. For the restaurant and the bar, it's, it's one parking space for every three seats in the, in the business. And then for the, f for the fast food uh, drive through restaurant, it's uh, one per four seats. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, a poor way to, to measure a parking requirement. Um, you know, we've had issues with it in the past. Uh, we're essentially relying on, on a business owner to tell us the number of seats and to, to keep that constant. Um, instead of relying on, on the number of seats, uh, we're proposing to switch that to a, uh, a parking requirement based on square footage of the building. Uh, one per 100 square feet, which uh, seems to be pretty standard uh, given other communities. And then uh, we do not have a, a parking requirement listed for hotels. Uh, so we're proposing to establish that as one per room uh, plus a, 
a requirement for other uses that are attached to the hotel, be it you know a restaurant or something to that effect, uh, to have a 75% of the required parking for that other use. You know, typically, restaurants attached to hotels re rely on a lot of their business on the, the customers of the hotel. And then banks are also not listed in the parking requirement. And we're proposing a parking requirement of, of one per 300 square foot, again, based on uh, research done with other communities. And then the, the very back page is the, the actual language uh, for that. Uh, and is uh, essentially an excerpt out of the parking requirement uh, table of the zoning code showing the proposed changes. Eric, how do you feel that these requirements are going to affect our existing businesses and the community? I'm sure that's a pretty broad question, but um, obviously the ones that don't comply will become non-conforming. Then I'm assuming as long as they don't expand their building structure, they can remodel use the example of McDonald's comes in and tells Missouri Boulevard that they've got to come up with their newest colors and scheme and all that so as long as that building wouldn't expand in size I'm assuming they'd still be grandfathered and be okay to do that kind of uh, renovation that's correct do you do you feel that what we're proposing is obviously you feel it's adequate for the for the city to provide off-street parking What do you think it's going to do to our existing businesses that are out there in these categories? Are we creating a 50% non-conforming? I mean, it's, I'm sure it's kind of a guess at this point. But well, just kind of generally speaking, if, if there's a business out there that's real tight on their parking and is looking at expanding their, their building, more than likely they're going to need more parking anyway, be it measured under the current code or the new code or just as a as a practical business uh, type of requirement providing enough you know parking for your customers um, you know, are there businesses out there that that would become non-conforming uh, most certainly yes uh, with a, a, a parking requirement based on seating um, you know switching over to the square footage I'm you know I'm sure that there's several that, that are going to to fall into that non-conforming category um, I think it's personally putting my planner hat back on from years ago. Um, I think it's good that you're defining it down to square footages because I agree that seats and tables and all that can vary so much. Um, and I know a lot of times we relied on building codes and or the fire department to say this is the seating capacity, but we all know that you know that's pretty hard to regulate. So I think it really gives uh, staff an opportunity to really look at a proposed use and make sure that we're going to have what we hope is an adequate amount of parking so I, I like I like this matrix any other comments or questions for staff on uh, parking if it's based on square footage uh, for example if, if there was a building that had a restaurant and let's say a majority of it was for storage let's say the building was huge but only like say the front part was used for the actual restaurant space seating area would, would there be a variance there, or would it still be based on the square footage? Um, I, I don't know. What I, I'm, I'm kind of just coming up with a positive. For, uh, for the mixed-use types of, of buildings, you know, be it uh, a restaurant that has a retail component, for example, we do divide those uh, in terms of looking at the square footage of retail and calculating that parking, parking requirement separately from the, the, well, in this case, the square footage of the restaurant. And then, uh, you know, combine those those two numbers to come up with a total parking requirement. So uh, certainly, if um, if there's a, a large building where only a small portion is is a restaurant and the rest is, you know, a warehouse, be it associated with restaurant use or not, then I mean, it is, you know, in in certain circumstances. I mean, it's kind of a broad statement, but it is separated in terms of the parking requirement that that's applied to it. Now, if the restaurant then you know decides to expand within that and, and take up more space then well you know even under the current code that they'd be required to to uh, show that they have adequate parking to support that uh, Eric uh, some some restaurants and bars uh, have have a good bit of outside seating sometimes or decks uh, how, how is that how would that be handled 
the uh, the outdoor area would would need to be calculated uh, in terms of the the square footage as well. So. Any other questions for staff? Eric, do you need anything from us at this point, or is this more for us to go back and read through and then we'll discuss it uh, again further, or where, where are we at with this? I'd, I'd certainly um, like any comments that you may have. Um, uh, what we're requesting at this point is uh, uh, approval to, to move forward and, and notice it up in, in the standard public notification format and bring it before you for these five items. Uh, next month in a public hearing format so that it can be voted on and brought on to the to the city council for adoption so you need a motion this evening from us with a vote or what are you looking for i think a motion with a vote would uh, okay be appreciated okay <laughs> um, with that comment does any of the commissioners have comments or questions and if not anyone like to provide a motion I would move that uh, we bring these items forward for a public hearing at our next meeting as already discussed second I have a motion and a second any other comments from the commissioners before we vote all those in favor Aye. all those opposed motion carries um, any other business or items this evening from anyone? We do have one. Yes, sir. Just a quick comment, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, on behalf of the mayor and my fellow city councilmen and, and myself, um, we'd just like to say thank you for your willingness to, to serve on this commission. Um, thank you is probably not said often enough to the folks who do serve on our boards and commissions, and it is greatly appreciated. Your willingness to serve signals your dedication not only to this community, but to the citizens that we serve. I'm sure that your schedules could be filled with a lot of other things during this time and the time that you spend in reading through your packet material and preparing for these meetings. So um, thank you to you, each of you individually and to your families uh, for your willingness to serve on this committee. Thanks. Thanks, sir. I will declare the meeting adjourned.